Russia as restrictions, sub acts of subversion, intrusion in domestic affairs, attempts to change everything as they please and to subjugate all that is ours from resources to culture. The Western regime nurtured the neo-Nazi regime and now it's using it to attack Russia in order to play off for their recent failures, whether this is Napoleon, Hitler, and the situation of global confrontation of Russia in its desire with strong resentment in its strong answer to the Western countries is very much alike to the Crimean War and so on. You can continue this list. There are one and the same actors, one and the same territories, but there is a slight difference. With each new attempt, the Western instruments is becoming less and less thick and moral. The Western countries continue, continue to promote the Zelensky peace formula. That's very amazing. On the one side, they ban the Kyiv regime any negotiations with our country to refuse from peaceful contacts and peace negotiations. Now, I'm not talking what had happened before that in Ukraine. I'm just talking about the year 2022 to make the Kyiv regime stop negotiation process with Russia and then just adopt laws which blocks any negotiations with Russia and then just concoct a peace formula and say that they allegedly stay for peace, but then they say that everything must be decided on the battlefield. So how can we guess whether this is a battlefield or peace formulas? In fact, everything is quite simple, and the idea is simple. Firstly, this peace formula of Zelensky, due to its political and legal flaws, has nothing to do with peace. And secondly, they use all opportunities to somehow find a solution from this impasse. But these attempts are futile because they un cannot realize all the mistakes of the path they have chosen. That's why they used the consultations held in Saudi Arabia on peaceful settlement. These negotiations launched a kind of a virtual working groups on the main provisions of this notorious formula, despite the fact that, as we know, no agreements during this meeting had been achieved so far. In fact, basically that is the case. They were trying to make some personal meetings, and they did not receive any consent from the international community. They could not impose, they failed to impose anything to the international community. And then the Collective West started to distribute any links for some online conferences and invite countries to participate in the discussion virtually of some questions related to Ukraine. I think it's beyond any limits. It's a fraud, a slight fraud, because all those who receive such links, the countries who receive, they do not even know who will be there on the screen who will communicate with them and I uh, and I'm talking with all responsibility they even do not know the list of those groups with whom they maintain a some virtual dialogue this liberal mass media as you remember ignored such prank what the United States is doing right now this is a diplomatic prank when they send links with proposals to participate in some discussion, and all those who respond to such links even do not understand where they participate. 
That is a diplomatic prank. I congratulate you with the creation of the new genre. But it's a fresh one. Implementation. In implement to, to engage the United Nations and other international organizations. But to be honest, that is the United Nations. So it's a direct violation of Article 100 of the UN Charter, or the principle of impartiality. And uh, it is no obstacle for the UN Secretary General, but that should be an obstacle. And uh, this notorious support for the peace formula and the involvement of the countries of the global south into an anti-Russian coalition, but in a blind way, because what has been proposed or forced by uh, the United States openly, it has been denied by the global majority. And then they uh, came to not plan B, not plan C, but um, obviously to plan uh, D. And they do not uh, state the ultimate goal and the rules of the game, but they just they're just trying to engage them into some uh, spider webs of those virtual working groups. So that's uh, the wisdom of our partners and their experience. The wisdom is based on experience in order to realize all the danger of the Zelensky formula and uh, those working groups and do not uh, accept those provocations. We have uh, information about uh, the largest cemeteries being uh, increased in Ukraine. So it's not just plundering of the country, but uh, the death of uh, the people who live there. And uh, there is also information in uh, the media that uh, the Kyiv regime is planning to continue the so-called counter-offensive. Please do not laugh. It will be, will be laughter through tears next year. Because the Westerners cynically demand uh, decisive actions from Kyiv, but uh, actually they are determined to wage the, an inhuman confrontation until the last Ukrainian. It's not just a beautiful phrase. That is the case. They are just trying to destroy the last citizens of this country, the last. And you see the way they are doing that. But I have a question. I know that the inadequacy of the people in Medbankova, it does not allow such questions, but still, was the initial plan like that? Just to place the Western puppets into the leading posts in Ukraine to destroy the state, the people as a nation, as a community, as a culture. Was that the initial plan? But that's the case, actually. The actions of the neo-Nazi regime in Kyiv have led to the total, total looting of Ukraine, which continues to this day. And uh, they are using this tragic uh, destruction of Ukraine for more plundering in order to create uh, some semblance of a fight against corruption and to, to reduce the degree of discontent in society. Zelensky and the authorities, according to the Ukrainian mass media, plan to introduce a bill in the Verkhovna Rada equating wartime corruption with state treason. And uh, then uh, the Kyiv regime will have to resign all at once, all its representatives. The need to dem demilitarize and denazify Ukraine is obvious to all sensible people who have fallen victim to a cynical Western deception. And uh, many in Ukraine, they uh, sincerely believed the West. The reasons were difficult, but then they used uh, some naive feelings, some were greedy feelings, some were doubt, some were not being enough confident enough. And that was uh, differently and as usual. The West, uh, as it, it has been historically, deceived everyone in Ukraine. But this deception is fatal for Ukraine. 
And I would like to say that on the 26th of August, the humanitarian cargo was delivered for the uh, residents of the Belgorod region. It contains um, some uh, clothing and footwear and the school kits for first graders. That was delivered by the Republic of Uzbekistan. The Russian side expresses its deep gratitude to the leadership of the Republic of Uzbe Uzbekistan for this gesture of goodwill that reflects uh, the higher level of relations between the two, two, the two countries based on the traditions of friendship, comprehensive strategic partnership at, and alliance. And I hope uh, that what will uh, now explode the information space, and uh, that's the right thing, uh, it will explode. Uh, the times when we just uh, limited ourselves uh, to reaction to double standards uh, with regard to Russia, these times have passed. Now we cannot afford ourselves to wait from the organizations that uh, impose double standards, some independent reaction, some adequate estimation of the events, because uh, many times they are not impartial. And they are talking about that uh, now for uh, these uh, crimes being uh, investigated and for the reaction to these clara crimes, uh, the joint work of the authorities is required. And uh, the post of ambassador at large uh, on the crimes of the Kyiv regime has been uh, introduced and uh, this post uh, has been uh, given to a participant uh, of the Konto group uh, to settle the situation in Donbass, Rodion Miroshnik. His responsibility is uh, to conduct on behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to collect uh, the information, to prepare reports based on investigations on uh, the most notorious crimes against uh, medical staff, journalists, uh, priests, and other people. This work will be systematic. I think uh, as soon as possible, Mr. Miroshnik will speak to the media himself and uh, inform uh, the global community on uh, the Kyiv regime crimes regularly. I would also like to say a few words. Uh, in uh, On uh, the 16th of August, a new book by Maxim Grigoriev and Dmitry Sablin, Ukrainian Crimes Against Humanity, was published. We will post a link to this book in the mm, text of today briefing. In this book, uh, the crimes uh, from 2022 to 2023 are mentioned. Uh, as you know, the uh, crimes of the Kyiv regime are not limited to these dates. It's not uh, the first book from uh, this uh, on this topic. Previously, ordinary fascism uh, war crimes of Ukrainian militants and ordinary fascism Ukrainian war crimes and human rights violations were published. We have uh, talked about uh, the constant uh, torture, shelling, attacks on hospitals, and uh, disappearance of civilians. All those data on truly heinous events have been collected by the International Public Tribunal and recorded in a new book by Mr. Grigoriev and Mr. Sablin. The author cites uh, more than 600 witnesses, uh, victims, and prisoners of war. They tell about uh, constant attempts of uh, shelling, loss uh, of uh, family members attempts to escape under fire from the territory controlled by the Ukrainian armed forces. The book describes uh, some heinous violation of uh, human rights. 
that allows to kill women and children, to beat uh, priests and clergymen. And these crimes of the Kiev regime will have no statute of limitations and will we'll continue to report on them, to provide information on them and uh, legal estimations. We have drawn attention uh, to the materials published in the Swedish media on the use of uh, broadband uh, internet materials by Kiev. These technologies can become uh, alternative Starlink devices. These uh, the materials are claimed to be used only for civilian purposes. So the Kiev regime is the so-called peaceful organization. It's a club of uh, neo-Nazis. So peaceful uh, Swedish businessmen will just supply some civilian materials, I think for some games, not m more. So let us be serious. What is that and uh, what is the purpose? The company does not deny. I would remind you that the Swedish company, that uh, it's, uh, these are dual use items. And uh, these uh, products can be used for military purposes to ensure, uh, uh, among other things, communication in the field. So those advertised peaceful, so-called peaceful technologies will be uh, used at the bank for coordination of uh, hostilities. And we perceive this as uh, another Russophobic action to please the United States and uh, controlled under the patronship of the United States. So it's a threat for all uh, the states and uh, that's just uh, direct access to satellites bypassing national operators and uh, widely used to interfere in the internal affairs of independent states. So that's to coordinate the illegal protest activities. I can cite an example. It was the Stalling terminals in Iran in autumn 2022. The Swedes, by their supplies, they just intended to manifest, uh, illustrate the effectiveness of their materials. But it's just uh, illegal uh, dual use items. They, they use for dual purpose, and uh, there will be actions taken by the Russian Federation. And what I have uh, spoken about at the beginning of the today briefing, I would like to to, to speak in detail on uh, two items. The media controlled by Washington, London, and Brussels, the narratives of uh, those media, political estimates this imposed concept. First of all, I would uh, like to speak about the situation uh, in the global grain market. And uh, we have all been uh, said that we should save uh, the poorest countries from famine to fight for people, uh, for the starvation to stop. And for that, uh, the grain deals were required, that it uh, acquired some uh, civilized form of the Black Sea Initiative, the package agreement, and so on and so forth. When all that uh, mystification was unveiled and uh, the uh, efforts of Russia were, mm, did not, were not fruitful because they were blocked by the West, and it, it became clear who becomes rich uh, due to that uh, and when uh, Russia left all that, there was a monstrous media campaign that uh, allegedly uh, food prices grew because of Russia's actions. And uh, here um, in the, all that, Moscow is to blame. That's the first topic I would like to highlight today. 
after the end of uh, the Black Sea Initiative, we can state uh, the lack of uh, uh, changes for the grain products in the world. And the market prices for grain they demonstrated a slight increase, and in further days, not uh, weeks, not months, but days, the price of future contracts for grain it just returned to its uh, former level. It just uh, decreased. And uh, at the end of August this year, the tendency has been confirmed by uh, other trading platforms where uh, the uh, price is fixed uh, at uh, the same level and uh, according to uh, the, the trade uh, the price for these products it decreased uh, and uh, its uh, current uh, price is 188 dollars uh, for a ton and in general, the aggregate indicators for the uh, agricultural products are comparable to the ones of the previous year. And uh, the uh, grain shipped uh, on uh, free on board conditions and uh, with uh, all the risks uh, in the port being passed uh, to the buyer, it was uh, 249 uh, US dollars for a ton. That's uh, less than mm, the price of the same period two years ago. It, I would highlight it was uh, two years ago. The purchases from uh, the French Iran uh, in uh, 2021 uh, year, it can be compared. Uh, uh, so do, uh, only uh, we see uh, these uh, figures. Are they concealed from the global community? And now I have uh, another question. Where are those uh, Western media, Internet uh, media, television? television broadcasts, where are all of them? Why do they not uh, deal with the facts uh, available to anyone who has uh, any desire to study the situation? The quotes of the grains uh, in the middle term can uh, be due to many factors among them are just natural factors due to climate change, drought, uh, hurricanes, floods, speculative actions in uh, markets. And uh, the third factor uh, is emergencies, for example, fires in France and Turkey in August this year. So unfortunately, it's an example of what I'm talking about. They were presented during the 58th session on uh, the 14th of June in London. This is not uh, the data of intelligence. I present you open data now. And according to the estimations of the Global Grain Council, there are currently no crisis uh, manifestations in the production of grain and their trade. So I have a question. Where are all the foreign journalists, Western, French, uh, German, and of course Canadian, who write about food security? Are we the only one uh, seeing and reading this? Moreover, the International Grain Council noted a decrease of uh, grain prices uh, in comparison to the previous season. It, for grain, it was 20%. Uh, Thirty-five percent for grain, twenty-six percent for uh, wheat, uh, and um, the the stop of uh, the Black Sea Initiative it allegedly led to um, a change of uh, food prices, and uh, Russia is uh, the reason for the turbulence uh, in world markets. So Russia has become a very inconvenient factor in uh, this uh,
product uh, case. And uh, not now, but around 20 years ago, when it restored its agriculture, back then the problems began with Russia because we became not only competitive, but also leaders in that sphere. Because for decades, for many years, we have been told that we cannot produce uh, food, uh, that soon we will be introduced into the club of uh, the civilized countries and be fed during their schedules and not when we want to eat ourselves. We just uh, realized that on time and uh, entered the club of the true leaders of the production of agricultural products. And then the real pro problems became, became, began for the West. Not only it was something wrong done by us, but uh, them having uh, problems with ideology, them uh, not allowing that even in their nightmares because of them being so-called uh, exclusive. So we observe attempts to force Russia out of the global food market and uh, to uh, and to support their own corporations. And all this hysteria around the grain deals, allegedly for aid to the poorest countries, it was uh, for only one aim, to decrease uh, our attractiveness in the eyes of global community as a producer, stable producer and supplier of food products. In order to continue to control, or to seek to control this area, in order to once again to reassert its dominance. It's very simple. I would like to say that we should have said for a long time ago that today it's impossible to feed the planet, to feed the planet without our country. And we compared to other countries, went as Western countries, has never politicized this factor. We have always been a reliable supplier of agricultural products. According to forecasts, the main supplies of wheat for 2022 and 2023, I mean the agricultural year, will be Russia, the EU countries, Australia, Canada, the United States, and Ukraine. And that's the sequence. According to the Department of Agriculture of the United States, the period for 23-24 will harvest about 800 million tons of wheat. It's slightly more compared to 2022 and 23. That's about forecasts. At the same time, while the stocks of this wheat in 2023 and 24 will increase by 1.5%, due to uh, increased production of global trade in wheat by 0.8%. We expect that Russia will increase its supplies to foreign markets by 4.5%. And now I would like to cite some Western sources. The British, the Economist Intelligence Unit, mentions that the wheat harvest in Ukraine in this agricultural year will reduce by 32% compared to 2021-22, up to 22.5 million tons. In 2023-24, this indicator will amount to 19 million tons, and the export will drop by 10 million tons. It's said that the British Economist Intelligence Unit did not write that the soil in Ukraine is now contaminated with radioactive wastes due to supplies by the United Kingdom with the projectiles with the depleted uranium. These supplies are being continued for several months already and are used by the Kyiv regime in the relevant territories to which we pointed out on many occasions. And the radioactive index 
also proves that point. And this impacts the quality of agricultural products from Ukraine. It's very sad that the UK, Canadian, EU newspapers do not say a word about this. At the same time, Russia continues to good faithfully implement its international contract agreements in exporting agricultural products. We understand the role of socially important goods for the social and economic development of Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Middle East in their achievement of sustainable development goals. We re we reaffirm, this can be reaffirmed initiatives by Vladimir Putin on supply free of charge to those in need of the tens and dozens tons of Russian fertilizers which were arrested in European ports, as well as wheat, to Burkina Faso, Zimbabwe, Mali, Somali, Central African Republic, Eritrea. While with the Russia's initiative, we are working out alternative supplies to the poorest states of the national foods in terms in order to compensate the damage from forced termination of this Black Sea initiative. Let me remind you that all the problems associated with the Black Sea initiative are because of illegitimate and immoral sanctions of the United States of America, the European Union, as well as all those countries who joined these sanctions or adopted them unilaterally against our country under U.S. pressure. And the second topic, the same old story, which has been developed and actively planted in the information space on anti-Russia sanctions that they damage only Russia. That's what we've been told in Brussels, London, Paris, Berlin. And no European Union do not suffer from these sanctions. So they say that they attack exactly the state, I mean Russia. And they did not say a word about any collateral damage from anti-Russia legitimate sanctions. That's what I've heard from Mr. Borrell, Biden, Blinken. Mr. Stoltenberg, everyone. Now, let's move on to the facts. The global economy continues to suffer losses due to total ending up of the United States and satellites of trade and economic ties with Russia and coerce other states to this. The key international high think, think tanks and the world side to the resources which are verified by the West. For the Western mass media to trust, because they trust the WMF, the World Bank, they trust it. So, please. As for the key, think tanks are trying not to focus on this. They are focusing on the restraining factors such as high level of consumer prices, tightening of monetary policy, overall debt, when Ukraine climate change, but nevertheless, this negative impact of anti-Russian restrictions for the globe for the development of global economic system in their reports is being taken into account. They do not want it, despite any bans or huge efforts of the United States to minimize such statistics. In fact, the World Bank shows it. So now let's start. The Monetary Fund believes that the, the current geopolitical tensions heated by sanctions increases risks of separation of the global economy into quasi-autonomous blocks. This fragmentation leads to a growth of restrictions in trade, in particular with strategic goods, including fossil fuels. This hinders cross-border movement of working capitals, technologies, and working force. Well, that's the key indicators of the global economy. As a result, this leads to commodity volatility, increased inflation, lower incomes of citizens, undermining collective efforts to implement 
the Sustainable Development Goals up to 2030. International experts are compelled to admit that unilateral sanctions of the United States, the EU, and the other satellites damage also their initiators. The Monetary Fund and the World Bank states the stagnating economy of the majority of G7 countries. The financial terms estimated, and we can trust them even in the West, the huge European companies since the beginning of the special military operation, and this coincided with those, according to Biden, how sanctions lost at least 100 billion euro. More losses were among oil and gas companies, financial structures and banks, as well as industrial enterprises. I'm talking firstly about economic operators from the UK, Germany and France. I believe that's the time and the moment to name them. Most losses were fixed among the following companies. British Petroleum, 23.3 billion euro loss. Total Energies, 13.5 billion euros. Uniper, 5.7 billion euros. Losses. I, I'm telling you losses. Fortune, 5.3 billion euros. Shell, 3.7 billion euro. OMV, 2.5 billion euro. Equinery, 1 billion euro of losses. Renault, 2.5 billion euros. Volkswagen, 2 million billion euros. Societe Generale, 3.1 billion euro. Re denial of the Russian fuel costs, for example, to the Polish state oil company or LEM, to 27 million dollars per day. That's a very important addition. Due to the closure of airspace of Russia, for the transit flights of the U.S. companies, the number of flights between the United States and China, for example, decreased up to 24 flights per week compared to 340 flights per week before the pandemic. And that leads to huge losses among the air companies. And the flights to Asia is being and spendings, huge spendings, are being fixed by the Asian operators. For example, the flight from Paris to Tokyo now lasts 14 hours instead of nine. That's very unprofitable. The Minister of Trans of Russia says that the losses of flight companies, of air companies in the United States and Europe, amount to $37.5 billion per week. And that's a very important amendment. In international payments, the share of alternative uh, currencies grows. The share of the, of the US dollar drop by 60%. Let me remind, in 20, 2002, this was 72%. Euro dropped to 19%. In 2008, it was 28%. And yuan, by the way, increased by 3% and increased three times since 2016. A number of states intensified the searches of the ways to use their national currencies in national payments. And of course, I'm talking about yuan. The blocking of Russian banks in terms of SWIFT stimulated the development of national instruments of the same potential, for, them, for example, in India, Iran, and so on. Trade in national currencies is being actively in shifted in Turkey, Arab Emirates, Brazil, Argentina, and many other countries. The president of Argentina and Brazil started to develop the monetary alignment of the two states and unwillingness of the West to deny the monopoly in the system of global financial management leads that to the creation of alternative financial platforms, for example, the Asian Monetary Fund. The Collective West continues to disinf disinformation campaign to accuse Russia of the crisis situation in the world food market. But this 
all the things are interconnected. Our country is charged with the looming global famine because of spock in global prices, food prices and fertilizers due to the special military population to defend the population of Donbass. That, and I cited just the figures provided by the international organizations where the collective West is a party to. They continue to discredit Russia as a reliable and responsible actor of global food market, one of the key suppliers of foods to the countries in need. In fact, everything is blocked by the Western countries. I'm talking about the payments, transport, and the cargoes, which Russia did not even transshipped as a humanitarian aid, but paid the de their delivery. to the destination points, to the most poorest states. Even the cargoes were blocked. At the same time, the international expert, experts name the root causes of this food inflation as shifts in the global economy, systematic mistakes and miscalculations in the macroeconomic energy and food policy of the large Western states. And of course, these are climate crisis, pandemic, its consequences, massive anti-Russia, unilateral sanctions, all these aggravated these negative trends and triggered disbalance of gl in global markets, mainly in the agricultural products. High energy prices for en which try, um, because of the Western desire uh, to shift to energy, to green energy, sparked tariffs transport for transport shipments. For example, natural gas, gas grew for example, up to 80 percent um, of all these waste is is the f goes for the fer because of fertilizers, and that's the objective argument of the growth of prices. For example, the potash fertilizers amounted to 562 dollars per ton. This is two point half uh, more than compared to January 1st, 2022. And this is compared to the crisis in 2008. This situation can trigger to famine in the poorest countries of the world. But why all this? Russia has always remained a responsible supplier. But uh, on the other hand, we cannot supply because we are banned of logistical infrastructure. Our cargoes are banned. Moreover, they are whipping up a hysterical campaign against Russia. All these trends have an unbiased factor in which the West, which the West hushes up. For example, Fowler underscores that the food prices sparked before the beginning of the special military operations. The group of researchers from the Swedish Agricultural University said that there was no connection between the situation in Ukraine and the price volatility on wheat. No one can say a word about this. Unilateral measures of economic pressure of collective West against our country aggravated negative trends in terms of transport and logistics. They blocked port terminals abroad, which carried out transshipment of our food and industrial items, international monetary logistical campaigns and banks stopped the credit uh, to ensure um, the de sales contracts uh, or fertilizers from Russia. That's the point. The West, indiscriminately blaming Russia in food crisis, hushes up the fact that the main beneficiaries of these food prices are huge corporations who produce and trade in agricultural products. Exactly of the West, I'm talking about the four great countries. This is Archie Daniels, American, Bunge and Cargill, as well as the Netherlands, Louis Dreyfus, whose share is, amounts to 75.90 global trade of in agricultural products. In 2022, Cargill improved increased its sales up to 23%, up to amounting to $165 million. There was a record profit, five times increase in profit. 
and they spend a lot of money on the PR campaigns, on this information propaganda, of all these stories about these grain deals. We can analyze the dynamics of the prices of the spendings on PR campaigns and that will make clear everything. A significant contribution to improve its indexes and profits of the subsidiaries in Ukraine. These four companies and as for the chemical corporation Monsanto, El Dupont, the numerous possess more than 17 billion hectares out of 32 million hectares of the fertilized lands, fertile lands. As a result, the Ukraine wheats it's just over flooded the markets of the Eastern Europe and just put on the brink of survival the local farmers. But that's just a story for children how they eat the, at the sweet and then they just died because of they eat a lot. Let me repeat, in July 2023, FAO recorded a slight increase of food prices, which amounted to 1.3 increase in June and 11.8 lower compared to July 2022. The dynamics of currency indexes of the first month proves that there are no harsh fluctuations for the prices of wheat. Immediately after the termination of the grain deal, there was a slight increase in prices, but the next day the price for wheat decreased. As for August 11th, the indexes continued downward. We've already voiced these figures and we can repeat them in the text of briefing. But all these trends, they continue. And that's the case. The aggregated figures of uh, the prices for food products they are comparable to the level of 2021 and it's just uh, not uh, uh, claims that the Russia or special military operation and uh, withdrawal from uh, the Black Sea initiative allegedly led to increase in food prices and allegedly our country is uh, the main cause of turbulence in food uh, markets. Please uh, base uh, all your statements on the facts and uh, make uh, some logical conclusions uh, on the basis of facts. So fail is far from uh, a normal solution and uh, an obstacle are uh, increased tariffs uh, to uh, process uh, food raw materials and uh, high inflation. Russia continues to fulfill its obligations uh, under international con contracts uh, to for export uh, products uh, and uh, the continued supplies of uh, our food products despite anything Despite the discriminatory restrictive measures by the U.S., uh, some media campaigns and other obstacles have a stabilizing effect on the global supply and demand balance. In general, the Western sanctions policy and Russia's measures to counteract the restrictions and adapt to new challenges have become a powerful trigger for the reformatting of the entire system of global economic relations. This process uh, has only just begun and uh, is gaining momentum and uh, the rebuilding of uh, global realities in uh, trade, in transport, in uh, logistics, uh, agricultural industry, it's, it is becoming inevitable despite the remaining uh, difficulties and artificial obstacles. I would like to pass to the next topic. It has just uh, been 
mentioned uh, in uh, the latest uh, hours, it's uh, regarding the situation in uh, the Gabonese Republic. The National Assembly dissol uh, declaring the dis uh, dissolving of the government and the transition of uh, the state power. It was after the Gabonese Electoral Commission announced the results of the presidential elections where Ali Bonga Odimba won. We are concerned about the deterioration of uh, the domestic situation in this friendly African country. We continue to closely follow the development of the situation and to hope for its early stabilization. According to the Russian embassy in Libreville, there have been no reports of casualties among Russian citizens in Gabon. We recommend that our contemporary compatriots refrain from traveling to that country unless absolutely necessary. Now, Afghanistan, a meeting of in the state Duma of uh, Mr. Mironov with uh, the Taliban uh, National Front of uh, Afghanistan we would like to comment on this situation. Moscow uh, continues to build uh, the interaction with the current government uh, of Afghanistan that uh, in the recent years in general has demonstrated uh, its ability to uh, control the situation in the country. Nevertheless, uh, the processes in the country have not yet become irreversible. There are serious risks associated with social economic problems, the provision of basic rights and freedoms, and uh, that will be used by uh, international terrorist organizations, first and foremost uh, ISIS, which is planning further expansion outside Afghanistan, in particular in Central Asia. And we call on Kabul and representatives of Afghan national minorities to engage in dialogue with a view to forming a truly inclusive government uh, and fight against terrorism and drug-related crimes uh, with respect to basic human rights and freedoms. I would like to draw your attention on another annual issue of uh, the Foreign Ministry of the Russian Federation that includes uh, speeches by Minister Sergei Lavrov on the issues of foreign policy for the past year. There is uh, the collection in Russian and English. The yearbook um, and photo materials uh, are published on the website. There is also an electronic version on a compact disc and uh, additionally published on the internet uh, portal and it will be uh, sent to universities, to libraries, and so on. And it is prepared by the Department of Information and Press and intended for diplomats, international specialists, and those interested in contemporary Russian foreign policy. Another topic in uh, Nat Bayum uh, in Hungary, after uh, in increased uh, restoration works, uh, the inauguration of the military monument took place. It was done, uh, financed by Russian companies, uh, namely Gazprom, uh, and uh, the monument was restored and its territory as well. And uh, on uh, marble, uh, there have been uh, posted names of uh, those who perished during the liberation of Hungary from uh, the German Nazis. And uh, for the 24th time, as you know, Glavo Padeka held uh, his summer games in the Zavidovo complex in uh, the village of Susha. And, uh, Representatives uh, from uh, more than 20 teams of diplomatic missions took part. Uh, also representatives of Russian mass media, the TASS news agency, the MIR TV channel. As you know, the participants were greeted by Sergei Lavrov, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. This uh, holiday for its 25-year history has become a symbol of professional solidarity of uh, diplomats from uh, different parts of the world. 
Glava Padeka uh, had uh, took part in uh, this event, as well as Vyacheslav Fatin, Svetlana Zhurova, and the fencing champion Galina Garokhova. They became uh, the chief arbiters of the competition. A detailed material will be today published in the text of the briefing, and you will know, uh, you will learn many interesting things uh, there. And uh, in Orenburg, another international Eurasia Global Forum ended in Yekaterinburg uh, on uh, the 27th of August. It became a, a, uh, the countdown was launched to the World Youth Festival planned uh, to be held in 2024 on the territory of Syria, and uh, that will host uh, 20,000 Russian and foreign guests. It was uh, about a discussion of uh, the current geopolitical environment, and uh, the declaration of a multipolar world was developed, whose uh, aim is to change the perception of the omnipotence, the so-called omnipotence of the Western Bloc. Mm -hmm. The main uh, pillars became the respect of the sovereignty of states, international cooperation, and joint solutions to global problems. Traditionally, on the last day of Eurasia Global, participants were awarded grants to develop their own projects. On the 29th of August, within the framework of uh, the UN General Assembly, the International Day Against Nuclear Tests is marked. As you know, this event is held annually. It's an opportunity to remind who bears responsibility for that. And uh, I think we should uh, mark this occasion, uh, this date, on the 6th or 9th of August. It was uh, on uh, th those days, 78 years ago, that the United States leadership implemented its decision to use nuclear weapons against the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those weapons were used against civil, civilian objects in Japan in order to prove to the entire world uh, the uh, force of those uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, as it has become known, those strikes were absolutely pointless, as the fate of militaristic Japan was sealed in, by August 1945. At present, there is a tendency to ignore the fact that the U U.S. was the only state to have used nuclear weapons. The distortion of historical memory can have serious consequences. There is a necessity to introduce a comprehensive ban on nuclear tests, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. But who creates main obstacles here? Just guess. That's the United States of America who denied to ratify this treaty. And an announcement, uh, a date marked uh, the Day of Solidarity in the fight uh, against terrorism, introduced uh, into the legislation after uh, an heinous terror attack in Beslan that led to the deaths, uh, among other things, of uh, minors. It's uh, just uh, an heinous crime that uh, illustrated the unification of all the global community against terrorism, but uh, in the, the current international situation, the uh, countering terrorism has lost its unifying basis. Now uh, the hybrid war is uh, openly conducted against Russia, and uh, the terror essence of the Kiev regime is being ignored, and it just uh, the terror Kiev regime is being sponsored. And uh, the isolation of our country by uh, the Western states have, has not been successful. As uh, Russia is conducting dialogue in, with friendly states, and uh, uh, they are of uh, priority to us. And uh, the fruitful cooperation is uh, within the CIS, CSTO, SCO, and uh, 
member states uh, in this uh, in this uh, associations it just uh, led uh, under the regional and anti terror sco structure and uh, the CSTO, it uh, can uh, deploy its collective peacekeeping forces. It's an important factor in uh, the sphere of its responsibility. And one of the most advanced cross-regional formants of anti-terrorist cooperation is the BRICS Working Group on Anti-Terrorism, elaborated in 2020 and 2021 under the Russian and Indian chairmanships the anti-terror BRICS strategy and uh, the implementation plan are the gold standard reflecting a sober and sensible vision of real rather than imaginary global terrorist threats. The Russian Federation also maintains constructive dialogue on counter-terrorism issues with the state of the African continent and the commonality of our country's approaches has, was reflected in the Declaration on Strengthening Cooperation on Combating Terrorism, adopted at the end of the second uh, summit held in St. Petersburg in June this year. We continue to coordinate our joint efforts in the multilateral formats, uh, including uh, those aimed at improving the existing mechanism uh, with the participation of this, the, all, all the states. And uh, regarding the uh, day of victory uh, over military Japan and the end of the Second World War, it's just uh, restoring the historical truth and uh, reflecting the uh, heroic deeds of uh, the Soviet people, the um, defeat of the enemy in Manchuria, Sekalin and the Kurils were a decisive contribution to the defeat and surrender of Japan, thus putting an end to the bloodshed started by Hitler's Germany and uh, opening the way to the restoration of long-awaited peace. After the co surrender of uh, Nazi Germany, Japan remained uh, the only Axis member fighting with the anti-Hitler coalition. During the Potsdam Conference of uh, the 26th of July 1945, there was uh, unconditional surrender and the basic principles for peaceful settlements in Japan, eradication of militarism, removal of uh, uh, military expansion, uh, severe punishment for war criminals, reshaping of uh, the areas of economy, the sovereignty of uh, Japan, and uh, as well as uh, the islands of Honshu, Sikoko, and some other uh, that are smaller, as uh, the as Japan denied those requests, the USSR declared war on Japan on the 8th of August. Led by Marshal Alexander Vasilevsky, our troops ent entered the Manchurian plain, uh, um, disfigured the Japanese forces into isolated groups. The enemy almost began to surrender and uh, the the uh, enemy troops were destroyed in Manchuria. Our uh, troops captured Habin, Mukden, Changchun, Girin, and uh, liberated uh, northeast China and North Korea. Landed on South Sakhalin and the Kuril Islands, and. Uh, Japan was deprived of real forces and opportunities to continue the war. Only as prisoners, uh, 640,000 Japanese servicemen uh, were taken as prisoners. On board of the American battleship Missouri on the 2nd of September 1945, Minister Mamoru Shigemitsu and Japanese Chief of Staff Yoshihiro Mezo signed an unconditional surrender act. And uh, the 
uh, end of the war with Japan marked the end of the Second World War. On the 3rd of September 1945, Soviet newspapers published Joseph Stalin's address to the nation, marking the victory over Japan. And uh, there was uh, the medal uh, for the victory over Japan, and it had uh, the date on its reverse side, the, the 3rd of September 1945. So that's just a historical uh, data for the name of this uh, day. And what is now happening uh, in the international uh, affairs is just uh, how the historical events are forgotten, how quickly. And uh, those uh, events, uh, the reckless events, uh, implemented in the present. Now, uh, the present Japan, with uh, the Fumio Kishida administration, is embarking on the path of revanchism and russophobia. It has been uh, uh, warned of the danger of the militaristic frenzy that engulfs Tokyo, and the war ended as a national cat catastrophe for Japan. We hope that uh, the Japanese people will have enough wisdom not to allow the politicians to repeat the fatal mistakes of their predecessors and uh, to abandon their dangerous plans that threaten to destabilize the geopolitical situation in the world as a whole. And I am ready to ask a question. Whether international life was with us. Good afternoon, Madame Zakharova. A couple of days before, Emmanuel Macron declared that the policy of the country excludes the, participation of di the direct participation of the country in the Ukraine conflict. He said that we are trying, we are seeking to avoid any confrontation. Let me interpret from French to Russian. He said that the direct engagement in the conflict with Russia, they are trying to exclude this possibility. That means that they provide for some indirect participation. But the nature does not change. Such statements of the French officials are not fresh. We are hearing time and again that France does not consider itself a, particip a party to a conflict. And another quotation avoids its escalation, seeks to avoid its escalation. So where are they located? And maybe they believe that someone will believe it. It, be it seems that France is trying to justify itself because there are facts. Let us recall the large-scale and, and unimpeded military and technical aid. Not the French people, but the politicians help. France was one of the first countries which started supplying the Kiev with, mu with munitions, launched the tank coalition, initiated the supply of military aviation, actively trains the U.S., the Ukrainian armed forces. Some recent admissions of Ambassador of Ukraine in France, Mr. Omelchenko, in an interview to Ukrainian newspaper Levy Beric on the regular meetings with the representatives of the general staff of France during when he, according to his words, he feels himself like being in the general staff of Ukraine. The, he was talking about the exchange of intelligence information. They agreed on the terms of long-range missiles and air defense equipment, and that proves indirect engagement of Paris in this conflict. Is that a direct way to escalate the crisis? If it's not a direct path, then it means something else. It is obvious that the Caesar artillery systems, the tanks IMAX 10RC and miss cruise missiles go to Ukraine not to be demonstrated and exhibited. Because of them, people are dying. The French arms are for many years are sowing death among civilians. 
destroy residential areas and civilian infrastructure. Everyone knows it. Maybe some people do not know because they are not told about this. And it seems that France has its share of responsibility. It is obvious for us that along with other Western countries, France continues to cynically use the Kiev regime as a tool to fight Russia. And this fight, Paris is ready to continue until the last Ukrainian, I believe. And let me remind you some more aspects. Responsibility of France is not because they supply weapons and when they say that they are not in direct engagement. So let us remember not the year 2022 because it was exactly France who was among other Western countries. But I'm talking about official representatives of France who stand at the very roots of the Ukrainian crisis. They participated directly in coup d'etat in Ukraine, not for once. They intruded in domestic affairs of Ukraine as a sovereign state. This was made by officials of France. Of course, now they would say that these were not these very political figures but some other and their predecessors, and that's they who are responsible. Maybe that's not they who are responsible, but France, being a country, is responsible for such actions. And another point. As you know, all these considerations about direct or indirect participation in a conflict this is just all not moral. This is not just fakes. This is beyond any moral values against the backdrop of colossal losses of lives, of civilian lives. This is beyond any moral limits. And yet another point. Does the LSA Palace cannot say they are doing loud. Let them say loud. Why do we do they for them? Do the citizens of France believe that this is not indirect participation? And maybe, and maybe it will be useful for Mr. Macron. I will share this information with him uh, for the future because you cannot be a little bit pregnant. And one more question, how would you comment on a statement by Joseph Borrell, the head of the European Diplomacy, who in his blog estimated the efficiency of uh, uh, sanctions against Russia, saying that they work, that they are effective. I uh, absolutely agree. That's uh, the case when I absolutely agree with Mr. Borrell. Yes, they are effective with their work, but primarily against the European Union. So I would like to ask him a question. Was it the initial aim of Brussels or it's just the situation? We have returned to this topic uh, many times today, but uh, I have just cited examples of the EU companies who bore colossal losses, losses due to these uh, anti-Russia sanctions. But we all see these pseudo-analytical publications by Mr. Borrell. I am sure that it's not him who is writing. I am sure that someone writes for him. I do not know whether he reads that before the publication. It just clear him of responsibility, but I'm sure that is not him who is writing that. Just wanting to convince uh, someone uh, that uh, the sanctions against our country are working just against us and only against us. This is just useless. The the economic considerations is just another attempt, attempt of the Western disinformators to make unsophisticated readers the illusion that Russia is weak. 
There is no withstand any criticism. The thesis at the end of this article that the economic isolation of our country is final, especially against the backdrop of this landmark event in South Africa, which symbolizes the new world order. If they want to talk about isolation so we can support this idea, was this self-isolation of the European Union, this was a self-isolation of the West, like the global minority, they encircled themselves in red colors, they called themselves a blooming garden, all the rest, they called the jungles, and that's the way they live. They should not call it is isolation of Russia, let them call it self-isolation. So there is no voluntary self-isolation of the EU. It was a step-by-step -step self isolation under US pressure. So let us recall Mr. Biden when he was Vice President of the United States when he told about his pressures on the EU to adopt anti Russia sanctions and the EU adopted such sanctions and all this continued at the new level and led to the flee of the EU companies from the territories from EU to the United States, re-registration there. This led to huge losses of profits. That's what we refer to in many mass media articles. By isolating itself from Russia and from Russia's energy resources, from Russia economy, they undermined their competitiveness on the global markets. And we scale up cooperation with reliable partners, with the developing centers of the global development, which are developing much more intense, in an intensive way. Russia made a clear example that any stifling unilateral illegitimate sanctions adopted by the Western minority bypassing the UN Security Council are ineffective. They are working against them. They are working indirectly, undermine the global processes, but they do not work the way they were designed to act. The international community and majority do not support these sanctions. Moreover, in the Johannesburg Declaration, the BRIC states recorded the general position, and I quote, unilateral coercive measures are incompatible with the UN Charter and detail negative consequences, especially for the developing world. It also expressed a concern because of the sanctions touching upon the trade in agricultural items. So to whom this address, to whom this message was addressed, and that's the result of this sanction war unleashed by the EU and the United States. The EU restrictions, this is just an instrument for intimidating and blackmailing. We consider it inadmissible direct threats to Russia's on behalf of Joseph Borrell, who said that the EU has not yet enlarged restrictions against supplies to Russia of medical items, food and medical equipment. And this is yet to be planned. Does he has any clear understanding what he's talking about? Is he sensible in this? Does he, is he aware that that was the logic of terrorists who captured hospitals, who captured patients and deprived them of the medical aid and so urgent medical aid? Is he sensible enough? Is he sensible enough in the words he is voicing? Maybe we can recall him of the blocked Leningrad to deprive the people of the food and to see how they are dying in the city. That was the Nazis' logic. We can ask a question to Borrell. Did he hear anything about the Leningrad blockade and those who suffered? 
this period. So let his advisors remind him of this event in the history. That's the repetition of the Nazi logic at the level of the leaders of the European Union. That's the statement is in line with other Borrell's statements that EU is like a blooming garden and all the rest is jungles. But it's much more worse because it reveals the nature of this structure and the nature of the people who lead it and which is based, the logic of whom is based on segregation of people. I'm not talking about political freedoms. So all this is forget, forgotten there and that is just a manifestation of neo-Nazism. And I've cited such examples. That's the logic of modern terrorists who capture hospitals and old people who need medical aid. And that was the logic of the Nazis during the Third Reich when they detained the whole cities in blockade and seeing how people are dying, were dying. And recently, the EU has warned sanctions not only to Russia, but even to third countries who refuse to accede to the anti-Russia sanction regime. It was exactly against them, the 11th package of anti-Russia restrictive measures who provide embargo for the supplies of the EU produ production to third countries. It is obvious that this, which seemed recently huge economy of the European Union built on exploitation of resources of the developing countries, does not cope with the consequences of the disruption of economic ties with Russia. We see deindustrialization, de shift of technological production in the United States, high inflation, huge state debt, and chronic budget deficit in the member states. You just you can analyze the statistical service of the EU, of the EU to see that economic growth of EU is at zero level and inflation exceeds the targets, especially its food component. It's 12.4 percent, and this is July of this year, and this decreases the welfare of a considerable number of citizens in the EU. Did Joseph Borrell make any comment on that? He is very happy about the reduction of trade with Russia. He made a report. I'm sorry. So what are the consequences of this block for trade? The EU indexes fell as well. Maybe he is pleased that due to his policy, the European Union pays three times for the gas and the EU producers were deprived of the markets to sell their products. I am I can agree with Joseph Borrell in one point. Anti-Russia sanctions, they are just indeed effective, but effective against the European Union with the hands of the leaders who stop to understand and to distinguish the interests of its own and the interests of Washington. And despite all hopes of Western analysts, we expect the GDP growth by the year 2024. So we'll see what, what will come next. Thank you. Let me ask you yet another question. How can you comment the response of the Greek Cypriot authorities on the launch of the Russian consular services in the Turkish Republic of the North Cyprus. As you know, the consular services to those citizens who live in the North has been carried out for many time. We believe that the Russian citizens should have adequate access to effective consular services and consular aid. And this work shall continue the way which is in line with our national interests. Thank you very much. Is Rush today with us? Madame Zaharova, good afternoon. Don Kotigert, Russia today. The Republican candidate, Kudahaley, during his debates, insulted the memory 
of the Russian permanent representative Vitaly Churkin draw comparisons between the aircraft crash and the, in the loss of life of Mr. Churkin. That, and she said that Mr. Putin was responsible. She's a liar. She lies. And let me suggest an experiment. If she does not provide any evidence of her wor words, and I can say that she won't do so, so you will con see it yourself once again. So there are no comments. This is in line with the U.S. politicians. They lie to everyone. And all those who are trying to tell the truth are becoming victims of those who lie. And that is very obvious. And second moment. When Haley will tell the international community who killed Kennedy. It's been 50 years when the world is waiting for an answer. This is the citizen of the United States. Like herself, that was the president of the United States. That was a distinguished political figure. If some Haley is talking about this, maybe she knows who killed Kennedy and cleansed the whole clan of Kennedy. And that's the second question. The first one. I ask her to provide evidence to your lie, maybe the basis. And the second point, can you tell us about the destiny of the presidents and public figures who were killed back then and the whole world does not yet know who killed President Kennedy? And everyone guesses. But officially, the United States of America has not answered to do this question yet. If you do not have any questions, is Komsomolska Pravda with us? Good afternoon, Madame Zaharva. Good afternoon. In September, Sergei Lavrov is expected to head the New York delegation to participate in the 78th session of the UN General Assembly. What is done in order to avoid repetition of the history of the story when the United States not issue visas to journalists who wanted to accompany the head of the foreign ministry. I would like so uh, I can say that the US Americans or the Americans do not issue visas both for diplomats who went to the UN generalist session, both for the political party which is called as political week and throughout the whole year of the UN General Assembly sessions. The United States did not issue visa to sports, to athletes, cultural figures, researchers, international participants of international contests, to parliamentarians, for those who went to the General Assembly or who went to in line with the interparliamentarian relations. So the United States of America denied visas to everyone, although they had to do so. And I would let me remind that in accordance with the agreement on the location of the headquarters of the United Nations, which is enforced since 1947, the United States assumed responsibility to ensure unimpeded access for accredited foreign officials there. However, we confront such problems not only with and that's not the case only with us, but uh, with other UN member states. Our position is very clear to the United States and we compelled to remind that here we see the huge abuse of the privilege of the location of the headquarters. The administration has almost arbitrary defines who can participate in the events and to whom access is denied. This is a flagrant violation of all norms of domestic and international law. This is unacceptable. And this is a flagrant violation of international law. And in case the situation repeats, of course, we will respond in a very serious way. 
and you know our reaction for non-issuance of visa for the last time. If you don't have any questions, is Media Cooperation China with us today? Yes, good afternoon, Madam Zaharov, and the Unilight activated uh, the drop of radioactive water from Fukushima 1 to the sea, ignoring objections of the international community. So some experts believe China or oh, the United States expressed hope to express support to Japan. And that question is very like, like um, an exchange of a play of courtesy between the two states. In accordance with the Agricultural Ministry of Japan, the United States is the country who reduced the input of agricultural products and fishing products in the first half of the year. So can you, how can you comment this position of the United States? Thank you. As a politicized So this question should be analyzed in terms of the existing laws, in terms of scientific figures. So that is why we call Tokyo to be very open on this sensitive issue. When we are talking about politicization, which the United States is engaged on a regular basis, then we see such stories. Representatives of Japan who defended that this water, radioactive water, is safe and it's safe to the extent that they can drink it, but they refuse to drink it. All the American politicians who supported Japan in this issue can be solidarity, express solidarity and drink this water being confident in its safety. Thank you. Is the uh, writers with us? Yes, hello. Hello, Madam Zaharova. We have two questions. The first of one, uh, I would like uh, to know the reaction of the Foreign Ministry for accusations uh, by the U.S., the State Department, who accused uh, Russia of uh, intimidation of American diplomatic staff with uh, accusation of espionage that uh, declaration was made against the background of uh, Robert Shonov, uh, the case of Robert Shonov, accused of confidential cooperation with Foreign Intelligence Service. How can you comment on that? So it's ridiculous. Is it uh, correctly Russia intimidating uh, the U.S. diplomats? I thought it's vice versa. Do you want me to cite some proof? I will just cite some facts that certify of the opposite. Not only of Russia not intimidating uh, someone, but uh, the U.S. intimidating Russian diplomats. We have repeatedly voiced the information, uh, cited the facts uh, of the increased pressure on Russian diplomats working in uh, the United States of America and uh, the countries that are U.S. satellites. What does that include? That includes uh, engaging in their work, uh, the uh, approaches uh, to get some information, psychological in pressure on diplomats, members of their families, children, and we have uh, spoken about blocking the accounts of Russian diplomatic missions. It has um, different forms. Is it just not uh, making the work more difficult and not intimidation, not allowing uh, to operate and uh, do not allow uh, normal operating procedures to the staff? It just includes not only salary, but also medical services, security, and uh, the settlement of many social issues. Another examples, 
just uh, seizures of diplomatic property of uh, the real estates where uh, were the working uh, space, the working space, uh, the office, the studies, the premises of uh, Russian diplomats, or where they were present, they were residing, and so on, and uh, the social infrastructure used by Russian diplomats on the territory of the United States. Is it not intimidation when we had to free our Diplomats, they had to free the sites of uh, Russian real estates on the territory, real estate on the territory of uh, the U.S. within 24 hours. Is it not intimidation when a helicopter was flying over Esther Bay and our real estate site there with a projector and uh, the cameras were filming from everywhere? how the Russian diplomats, they had uh, less than uh, two days, just 24 hours, to carry all their belongings from there and uh, to place that uh, same site on some conservation. It was just 24 hours. And that was with the noise uh, of all those helicopters. And... Uh, the projectors, they just uh, brought light into the faces of Russian diplomats. And uh, the Russian diplomats who were given uh, several days uh, maximum uh, or only 24 hours, and doing that uh, with uh, the last day of their stay on the territory of the U.S. being the day of uh, flights not arriving into uh, to, to that city for the Russian diplomats to automatically violate the U.S. legislation. And uh, that was the day chosen by the American authorities when there were no flights to that city, no direct flights uh, the U.S. Uh, Russia, to Russia. Is it not uh, intimidation when people were given two days to pack uh, with their children to terminate their studies, uh, and it was a distance of uh, several hundred kilometers to find the flights and special flights that just uh, uh, saved uh, them. And uh, that was just no non issuance of visas, it is constant, and uh, no prolongation of uh, visas uh, on the sites. Uh, and, uh, the constant manipulation of a uh, visa issue, is that not intimidation? And uh, the posters being placed uh, in front of our diplomatic and consular missions with some proposals to join uh, the American Special Services and uh, the advertisement banners on the screen of uh, the computers of Russian diplomats with the elements of psychological pressure, is it not intimidation and direct threats uh, posed in front of our diplomatic missions, the performances that are staged, telephone threats p to personal uh, working numbers, email messages uh, uh, with threats of uh, threats to Russian diplomats and their family members, is it not intimidation? Can some American colleagues cite something similar? Never. Just response to some offenses by uh, the American side. Now, with regard to Shonov, the Russian investigative uh, authority is conducting the necessary activities and uh, need to identify those who participate in that case uh, and. Uh, the media has provided legal justification of the actions by Russian authorities. Thank you. And the second question, the detention of uh, Russian um, military officer and uh, right-wing activist Jan Petrovsky from uh, the Rusic group participating in uh, military hostilities in Ukraine. And in Telegram, uh, Mr. Petrovsky was accused uh, the uh, Russian uh, 
diplomatic staff was accused of uh, unwillingness to provide assistance to Petrovsky. Do you have some response to these accusations? Are there any contacts with um, Petrovsky himself, with his family? What is the justification by the Russian foreign ministry? Because now he is threatened with extradition to Ukraine, where he is accused uh, of uh, war crimes. Uh, There's a criminal code. So uh, mm, where was Reuters when Maria Butina was uh, in American prison in solitary confinement? Where were you? So you. You are worried by the fate of Russian citizens, by this topic. And Victor Booth, do you remember him? Where were you? I do not uh, remember any question. Dear Reuters, please uh, remember today, the 30th of August, 2023. So let it be written in golden letters for your agency. So you are concerned, actually concerned about the fate of uh, Russian citizens who are arrested uh, uh, abroad, uh, who find themselves in complex situations. Please do not forget about many other people who are now in American prisons, who have been previously convicted, who are prosecuted. It's just some fantasy. I will just call just now Konstantin Yeroshenko. He will not believe that Reuters as a whole is engaged in the fate of uh, Russians arrested abroad. So many years, so many years, we have drawn attention to that. No question by Reuters. In no way, no in written or neither in written nor in verbal form. I remember very well when Konstantin Yeroshenko was asking for help. He needed medical surgery. And we thought what he will say will be supported by uh, the Western media. But uh, no, only um, Russian diplomats supported uh, him. Uh, and it was just uh, severe dental pain. There were no painkillers. He was not provided painkillers. Just talk to Victor Boot, and Maria Butina is open for interaction. So it's just three persons, and Maria Butina, uh, for many months, she was the uh, avatar of uh, the foreign ministry in social media, and uh, no Western media was interested in that, in their fate, and in the fate of your compatriots because the country of origin of Reuters is Great Britain and Julian Assange was somewhere in London and we will now reply your question. It's a pity you have not seen the, uh, that we have already responded because uh, the information has already been published on the website of the ministry, on uh, the social media of the ministry. But I will repeat, uh, the information from the 20th of, the 20th of July is very important. The date, Voislav Torden was detained by the Finnish border guard service while attempting to fly to Nice from Hensel Kiwanta airport. Then he was placed in a temporary accommodation center where in the earlier asylum seekers are accommodated. He has a Finnish, Finnish residence permit and uh, is listed in sections uh, lists as Jan Petrovsky and might be wanted by the Ukrainian authorities. That was not reported back then. According to the explanations received from the Finnish law enforcement authorities, the detainee was free to use the telephone and was informed of his right to contact the Russian embassy. So there were no personal requests to the embassy which would have enabled uh, the necessary consular assistance. So they were not uh, provided. Uh, and um, Mr. Torden has been represented by a local lawyer since the end of July 2023. 
On the 23rd of August 2023, the police informed the embassy that uh, Mr. Torden uh, was transferred to Vanta prison for further extradition in a criminal case. Only at that time it became known that Mr. Torden had previously had the surname of Petrovsky. And uh, the Ministry of Justice of Finland received a request from the Prosecutor General Office of Ukraine for his uh, participation, I cited, in a terrorist organization or facilitation of the activities of a terrorist organization, Article 258.3 of the Criminal Code of Ukraine. The case was initiated in 2017 after receiving Torden's personal appeal on the 23rd of August. The measures uh, to assist were taken. He was visited by consular staff on the 25th of August. A hearing of the Finnish court was held, which decided to extend the period of detention. On the 28th of August, a consular officer of the embassy, together with a lawyer, visited the detainee, and uh, the request for a visit was sent beforehand, several days before that. So it uh, was at the local authorities several days before being agreed. During the meeting, the Russian citizen said that he had no complaints about the conditions of detentions and uh, expressed his wish to return to Russia as soon as possible. The Russian embassy in Helsinki continues to keep the matter under its special control and is ready to provide appropriate support to Mr. Torden in order to ensure the detainee's legal rights and interests. The efforts taken to assist Mr. Torden is reported in detail by the embassy in Helsinki also through social network Kentucky and Telegram and reposted on uh, the online account of the ministry. Thank you. You are welcome. Is news dot are you with us? Yes, hello, news dot are you is here. Our first question What's the relationship of Moscow to the promises by Emmanuel Macron to uh, increase uh, his efforts, uh, peacekeeping mediator efforts uh, with regard to Baku and Yerevan and exerting pressure on Azerbaijan. So on one hand, we welcome any initiatives that do not run counter to Russia's efforts to normalize relations between Azerbaijan and Armenia, that do not duplicate or undermine them. However, France's activities uh, here are well known and within the framework of such mediator efforts, we just need to consider the position of uh, both sides of the con conflict, uh, both Armenia and Azerbaijan. Without that, uh, we do not need to, uh, we, we cannot settle this situation. It's just the basics of any mediatorship. The second question, how can the foreign ministry comment on the discussions of, uh, in the Turkish media that the Ukraine agreement may be extended without Russia's participation at all. As such speculations and element of pressure on Russia cannot be uh, perceived as a threat. And earlier the media reported talks in Istanbul with the Russian delegation uh, and do such contacts make sense before the meeting between the presidents of Russia and Turkey. So it's a very broad question. First of all, materials in Turkish media. I think that any journalist can present their point of view. It's not the point of view of a state, but of some journalists, political scientists, and so on. The second one, can uh, the Ukraine agreement work without Russia? It's just like uh, the G8 without Russia. Without Russia, it will be G7. So those stories, they should have some logics behind them. If it is about an agreement where Russia participates, it cannot work without Russia. 
is just physically impossible. If it's about some other agreements where Russia does not participate, you just need to state it directly. So globally about the position of our country. The President of Russia has made uh, many statements on that issue and uh, we have withdrawn from this uh, Black Sea initiative, the Grain Deal, because our interests were not observed by the parties and it was clear where the obstacles are placed for implementation of what has been agreed by everyone and guaranteed by the UN itself. And it was reported uh, and uh, said by the president of our country that uh, with the implementation of what has been guaranteed to Russia to a full extent, uh, it's about the return and uh, the observe, and observing of all the provisions to a full extent. So after that, we can discuss the, this topic. Then one of the issues discussed during the uh, Russian-Turkish talks announced today by me is uh, the Black Sea initiative to import the Ukrainian uh, food products and uh, the memorandum uh, to uh, ship uh, our uh, pro food experts. And uh, questions can be asked uh, at the press conference of ministers on the outcome of the discussions. Our position remains open. It has been uh, voiced by our president and our head of the government many times uh, and uh, I have provided you the comments on uh, all the other issues. Thank you. Is Compact TV, TV Germany with us? Yes, good afternoon, Madame Zakharova. Good afternoon. I have two questions. Who is responsible? for implementing the tasks of Wagner Company. Is there, there an official position of the Crimea as for the new leadership of this private military company? Uh, you don't have an in-depth question. I should not recall the legal side of this affair. I'm talking about the lack of this legal status of this private military company. So in this regard, I believe that this question is inadmissible. You've said a, we've said a lot that sovereign states exactly once you've mentioned the when realized the importance and the need try to find the companies, the legal entities, some private individuals whom they employed, recruited. That's the question of some specifics in order to ensure security, fight against terrorism, protection services, and so on. So who among these countries back then or in the future will deal with the relevant activities should be addressed to these countries. I think that's it. Thank you for your answering. Of course, I'm following your channel and I know that for you this question is very simple, but we believe that we want to know for our citizens in Germany, know your position from you, voiced personally by you. Without depth, you, I've said, I meant that I've said a lot on this topic. And so you had a very simple question, but in fact, this topic has a fundamental meaning and you can take even quotations 
So I've just briefly told you all this that was spoken about at various levels. Now I understand your point. The second question. Now there are rumors in Germany, regardless of our regime, that allegedly the Prigozhin aircraft was accompanied another private aircraft by another aircraft. Is this true? And if this is true, do you have the list of passengers on board? Me, as a representative of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and even as a citizen of the Russian Federation, so I get information from our law enforcement authorities. All information available to me, I receive it exactly from the authorities who are responsible for investigation, and then I would advise the same to you. So next time I will ask you more serious questions. So welcome, please. Is Moscow Post with us? Good afternoon. We have several questions today. And to one question you have already answered. We would like to know, is there any progress on the Askar Kubanich Beck issue? I would like to say that so let us recall the most complicated cases with our citizens, regardless whether this was kidnapping by the U.S. services or whether it was a kind of fakes, whether it was the pandemic and lockdowns, whether this is a humanitarian story associated with disasters. Were there any cases when the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and our embassies, our diplomats ignored and did not deal with such cases? We've seen a lot of such cases, the tremendous numbers within the last decade. These are tragic stories who required rapid response, tolerance, and very careful work of every side engaged in this process. As soon as this information wave begins, I believe, I, I believe it starts the day before, and it seems that the person does not obtain any aid. But in general, we should remember that we have moral values. And every day, on a daily basis, our diplomats, diplomats everywhere, whether in Moscow or in permanent missions, prove by their deeds and the results of their work that we do not leave our citizens, regardless of political views, concepts. If we're talking about a Russian citizen and his constitutional rights, we stand ready to help him and do the utmost, and so on and so forth. And I would like to caution everyone, both the mass media and bloggers, and those who do not stay indifferent, not to believe to these so-called traps when you see when the Western mass media are trying to use this topic in order to make clashes inside the society, in order to plant some stories that we do not help our compatriots. When were all of them, when Madame Butina was detained, and many other cases when our aircraft, for example, was trapped before, because of a lockdown, who were not let down from the cities, including in the EU, did not have a possibility to take the flight and go back home. These situations were hushed up, and now they are trying to take this opportunity in order to 
devalue our deeds to help the persons, the Russian citizens. So I would request you, and I know that your media outlet, who always respects and supports our citizens, and I would ask you to remember and to rely on the our shared experience which we've accumulated within the decades and which is quite natural to us. As for the, as you've said, Mr. Kuba, Kubanichbek, on the 2nd of August we've made some comments and right now I don't have any additional information, any updates, but we will share it as soon as it appears. Thank you very much for your detailed answer. And the next question, Sergei Lavrov, the sideline of BRICS excluded, vetoed accession of Germany and Japan to the UN Security Council as permanent members. In his arguments, he cited that uh, these that these countries are entering on the path of militarization. Tokyo has increased its defense spendings and located their defense companies, how can you react to all these actions? The first point, as for the participation, or some claims of Germany and Japan on the expansion of the UN Security Council and its permanent members. What is the added value from their participation? There should be some sense in this. They completely associated themselves with the Washington's policy, completely. They do not have the spheres or areas where they would defend their own and national interests rather than follow the policy of the United States. And the world will see yet another two hands would veto any our proposals and push forward the U.S. proposals. As for the expansion of the U.N. Security Council and its permanent members, we've talked a lot about this. Apart from the considerations we have, you should understand that today we see that among the permanent members of the U.N. Security Council, the United States, Great Britain, and France are almost identical in their views because they strictly follow the U.S. policy. And these three countries who vote almost the same, who share the one and the same approach and does not contradict to each other for many decades. And right now they want to add the votes of those non-permanent Western states who are either the EU or NATO partners and who vote the same in accordance with the NATO stance or associate themselves, it's an official position of the countries, every single time. I don't think that it would be necessary. In my view, we should study carefully the participation of the countries in the alliances, in military alliances, for example, whether they have a provision on ob obligatory voting and obligatory adjustment to its policy, into the alliance's policy, and to take into account this position when they want to be a permanent member of the UN Security Council. If a country wants to build their, to pursue their foreign policy in line with this organization and do not contradict it, so what's the sense in its participation, the political decision making or implementation of political decisions as a individual and permanent member state of the Security Council? We know that, for example, the position of all NATO states, for example, on the Ukrainian conflict is quite identical. They cannot even defend their own national interest against the backdrop of what is playing out there. Of course, I'm not talking about the General Assembly. 
And that's the second point, a very important one. That's not only the national capacity of the countries who worship their service to the United States, but they block obligations. For example, Germany is a NATO country, and now they are trying to engage Japan into this NATO-centric axis. Plus, their national policies for full association with the United States in terms of geopolicy and their obligations under their alliances. And the second point, it's remutualization of Japan. We're talking, in, we've been talking about this on many occasions during briefings and strategic statements and in articles. During statements of our representatives abroad, we point to the Japanese side on admissibility of any military activity which threatens security of the Russian Federation and destabilizes the situation in Asia Pacific as a whole. Our concern is being shared by other Asian states. We took demarches against Tokyo on diplomatic channels, including because of the more frequent Japanese military exercise, including joint uh, exercise with the United States and other NATO states uh, in close proximity to Russia's borders. And we made a report on such an event, which was carried out by the Japanese side uh, east to the Kurilis Islands. And we warned that such provocation in close proximity uh, and increased tensions will not remain unanswered. And the last question. The, Germ the government of Germany said that investigation into blasts at North Stream 1 and North Stream 2 is continued. What can you say about this? We can say that they were more rapid. They were quite quick. As for the Novichok and Navalny, there was a very prompt investigation just burst into the international environment in a week or two or maybe the even three or four days chemical component and the people i'm referring to and the person was defended in terms of everything and the chancellor even visited mr navalny who was contaminated. This was a very fast investigation. They made political declarations. It seemed that they should have found a formula of this chemical component. It was clear from the very beginning something is hinder, hinders the process. Nothing, there is no progress at all within the year. And to be serious, and it's rather difficult to speak serious. So let us recall, we see huge speculations in mass media, many versions are which are deliberately planted. Why? First, then there was a very long pause, a monthly cause, pause, and the absence are not even a clear explanation. There was no word on behalf of Berlin. They just hushed up everything. After this monthly silence, indeed, a very high-profile investigation of a respected American journalist, Mr. Hirsch, and his views based on the evidence he found after that, as you remember, there were official comments of Mr. Dujaric that the United Nations does not have a mandate to hold investigations. After all these events, on the one hand, the Western mass media started to make some versions, and on the other hand, Russia, in order to make some progress, introduced to the UN Security Council an option to assign their organization with a mandate to hold a legal investigation. On the 21st of February, upon our initiative, we held 
a meeting of the UN Security Council. Nevertheless, on the 27th of March, and I would like to recall the best three countries, the United States, France, and Great Britain, refused to support uh, the establishment of the relevant, relevant investigative mechanism. That was for a reason, and the declarations of Germany, Denmark, and Sweden that they allegedly informed Russia of the investigation is not true. No one informs us of anything. Our requests for joint investigation or to include investigative procedures were just denied. They also ignored the calls the calls of Mr. Mishustin. On the 14th of March, we disseminated correspondence with the competent authorities of the European states as an official document of the UN Security Council. It states unwillingness to uh, to engage the Russian side to investigation of the, these acts of subversion. There was another letter with the chronology of all the events. So what we are seeing now, there are no evidence is working to, cr to make everyone clear to make everyone seem that they are not in complicity. And they plant some fake stories, alternative versions, in order to make a sense that someone is doing something. So I cannot imagine to what this lead to, will lead to. Nevertheless, this investigation is very closed and does not rise trust. In my, I take the view that this was an act of terrorism and we will insist on holding an unbiased and detailed investigation into all these circumstances. Because this was a flagrant act of terrorism. This was a peaceful project which provided energy security it was blasted, as it was described in the international legal documents, as a terrorist act. There was environmental impact, huge entailed huge financial losses by many parties, state operators and private companies. I cannot just imitate. Uh, it will not be possible. Thank you. Is CNN News 18 with us? CNN News 18, are you with us? No? So if they are not here, let us move on. Is Varelk here? Yes, hello, Madam Zakharova. We have three questions today. On the 28th of August, the Azerbaijani side detained three Armenian citizens who were moving to Armenia, and uh, the peacekeepers did not interfere, although oh, that was conducted with the mediatorship. What can be done in order to return uh, these and other Armenians detained in the Lachian corridor and for these uh, uh, not to be repeated. I would like to remind that uh, the current situation in the Lachin Corridor is a consequence of Armenia recognition of Nagorno-Karabakh as part of the territory of Azerbaijan, which was recorded at the summons uh, with the participation of the two leaders under the auspices of the European Union in October 2022 and May 2023. This is in connection with the situation around Nagorno-Karabakh and we think that it is inappropriate to place responsibility in this context so on the Russian peacekeeping contingent. We think that the new conditions created by Yerevan's recognition of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, all possible assistance should be provided to Azerbaijan on the ground and uh, also the direct dialogue between Baku and Stepanakert. 
So my next question is about this dialogue. It's about uh, the Russian side proposing to hold a meeting with Azerbaijan on the territory of Azerbaijan. So what's the guarantee that the Azerbaijani side will not detain, will not violate its obligations? So we should uh, just meet the obligations, implement them, and that's the guarantee. So it's a very simple answer. If something has been agreed on and signed at uh, the highest level, it should be implemented and not interpreted, not uh, attracting, uh, engaging some uh, third parties or some fifths or tenths parties even. So it's some uh, some um, minor games. So if there are agreements, they should be implemented. So that's the guarantee. If there is some dirty business in implementation, so the guarantees here are not observed. Madam Zakharova, I would like to precise this question because for the Armenian society it's not clear. So what uh, agreements do you mean? It's a little bit unclear. So what uh, agreements were violated by the... Uh, so I have not uh, mentioned the word violated. What they implemented, so... Um, I mean that what has been agreed on should be implemented. The implementation of an agreement is a guarantee. You have asked what the guarantee is. I reply that it's uh, the implementation of agreements. And uh, just a minute ago, I spoke about uh, a radical change of the Armenian leaders. It was just 180 degrees not uh, 360 degrees, uh, but you, you are saying what has not been implemented. The position on a key issue has been changed, uh, changed radically for the issue that is key for Yerevan. So it's the issue of Yerevan, of domestic, uh, the domestic uh, decisions and so on and so forth. But there are obligations of the parties that were uh, signed by uh, they were signed uh, and enshrined but uh, they uh, their implementation is uh, the guarantee what you have asked for about so uh, the third question uh, of uh, yesterday information that uh, the russian peacekeepers uh, let uh, through some uh, citizens, so why uh, were they let in and uh, what can be done to block the Lachin corridor? And so uh, this is the competence of uh, Russian peacekeepers. If it needs to be precise, I can precise what can be done to the block. I have just uh, answered you in detail uh, during the, my reply to your first question. So why uh, is this just so actively proposed for the authorities of Artsakh to deblock the road to the Lachin Corridor? So we are proposing to actively deblock? I do not understand. According to media reports and uh, the uh, declarations of the Artsakh authorities, so I'll just precise about this uh, uh, access, uh, and I will return uh, to you. So is uh, the Journal of Compatriots together with us? Yes, hello, Madam Zakharova. My name is Valeria Lebetiv. Hello. The day of unified uh, voting is uh, approaching. What is the situation in this, this year with uh, the voting uh, for citizens uh, of Russia abroad? I would like to note that on the basis of uh, Russian consular and diplomatic uh, institutions, voting is organized only on the federal level. So you are talking about the September election campaign. It's uh, regional. So uh, Russian citizens abroad, their participation in the elections in this format 
both uh, distantly and in place, is not envisaged by the legislation of the Russian Federation. Any additional questions on this matter, please address them to the Central Electoral Commission. If you need contact, I will provide it to you. Thank you. Tverskaya Tutin newspaper. Hello, Madam Zakharova. We have three questions. So, uh, within the framework of economic cooperation, do the BRICS members plan to open branches of member countries' banks in Russia and vice versa? So, the BRICS countries pay serious attention to the development of financial interbank cooperation. Context on various, uh, in various areas continue on payment instruments, secure platform for multilateral cross-border settlements, practices of using uh, digital currencies and other innovative financial technologies are being studied. The Johannesburg Summit Declaration, 22nd, 24th, August 2023, uh, sets out the intention to strengthen uh, the banking networks and uh, settlements in national currencies. The relevant dialogue is being conducted, including through the ministries of finance and central banks of the BRICS countries. At the same time, it should be noted that uh, the opening of bank branches in foreign countries is primarily of a commercial nature and settled uh, in accordance with uh, domestic uh, legislation and on, the, on a bilateral basis. Thank you. One more question, please. Yes, as much as you want. I have missed you. Yes, we too. We have missed you very much. An aide to the President of Ukraine, Mikhail Padalak, uh, said that uh, partner countries have given Kiev the go-ahead for strikes on Crimea. Are such uh, steps by the Western coalition uh, uh, a testimony that uh, the West is ready to for direct confrontation with Russia? So, you know, about them uh, ready for a direct confrontation, those Western countries, it's not a declaration of some aid, some uh, first uh, or 21st or 49th aid to President Zelensky, but their specific actions, shipments of our weapons, so it's just some perverse forms, uranium munitions and the cluster munitions, heavy weapons, deadly weapons, not connected with some uh, other aim as to kill as many people as possible. So that's the indicator of their desire to escalate the conflict. Political material support, ideological pumping, and the uh, provision of uh, intelligence data used by the Kyiv regime to strike the civilian infrastructure of our country. It's just a testimony of uh, the Western plans initially to changing uh, the legal, legitimate authorities of uh, uh, Ukraine to this Kyiv regime and to create a platform in Ukraine for endless uh, drills, uh, NATO drills in uh, the Black Sea waters on the territory of Ukraine. They have been conducted uh, before 2022, before 2014, uh, always. And uh, the uh, ultimate purpose always was uh, to define the enemy as Russia. Uh, and that's uh, the specific implementation. Yes, uh, their plans were broken, and uh, that was intended to be a quick uh, victory. And those illegitimate uh, conditions within Ukraine of uh, imposed political figures, heavy supplies of weapons for many years, NATO standards for Ukraine, economic sanctions that were to finalize all that, endless flow of money, 
the turnover of weapons, finance, and uh, the uh, east, the organs. I mean, black trans transplantology. And uh, that was intended to yield uh, other results. And what our country is doing, they are just uh, failing. They fail. So that's the nervous actions. It's uh, already open escalation. We have already talked about that today. So we should not uh, base, uh, be based on uh, the statements from the bank of air. It is a, a demonstration that the Kyiv regime is in an impasse and uh, demanding uh, even more from its creators, demanding to be more active to protect the Kyiv regime because they understand they are in an impasse. It's uh, just a new detail. Other things are just old, uh, deep things, uh, obvious, and leading to one fact only leading to destabilization, to case that is a uh, identification of the collective West. Uh, another question, head of uh, Republika Serbska, Milorad Dodik, uh, offered to Bosnia and Herzegovina to apply for BRICS membership. How, uh, what's your view? Uh, of uh, this accession of this association. So just um, let us uh, go through the interaction with BRICS. Uh, there have recently been no uh, negotiations until recently, and uh, if uh, such requests are provided, they will be mm, paid attention to. and. Um, the next issue is a constructive input of uh, Republika Serbska to the formation of a, a multi-vector and balanced foreign policy of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, that would meet uh, the interests of all constituent peoples of the country. So we think that uh, it's an integral element of the Dayton architecture of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, when in Sarajevo, Oh, under the pressure of Western forces, uh, there have been more cases of violation of the fundamental postulate on uh, foreign policy issues. Thank you. If we have no other questions, goodbye to you until the next time. And I wish you well-being and uh, see you. And I can say that next uh, briefing will be held. Uh, it's all just going to that in Vladivostok on the sidelines of uh, the Global International Forum that is traditionally held there. We will inform you additionally on that account. We will uh, post uh, accreditation. Uh, announcements. Oh, excuse me, the next one will be in Moscow on the 5th of September and on the 13th of September it will be in Vladivostok. So we will meet in Moscow and then uh, it will be in Vladivostok. Will it be uh, with the presence? It will be with the presence or hybrid online for format is uh, always done. Thank you very much. Prosperity to you. All the best.